Good afternoon. I'm Adrian Dix, BC Minister of Health. To my right is Dr. Bonnie Henry, uh, BC's Provincial Health Officer. Uh, I want to uh, acknowledge that we're on the traditional territory of the Lekwungen speaking people of the Songhees and the Esquimalt First Nations. Uh, tomorrow, uh, Dr. Henry will be uh, briefing here, uh, here in Victoria at noon. And then on Monday, the briefing will take place at 1.30 and we'll have more information about the rest of next week on Monday. And with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Bonnie Henry. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, for our case update today, uh, we have uh, 53 uh, new uh, test positive cases in British Columbia, making our total number of cases who have tested positive in the province 1,174. That includes 541 who are in the Vancouver Coastal Health Region, 412 in the Fraser Health Region, 74 on Vancouver Island uh, Health Region, 126 in the Interior Health Region, and 21 now in the Northern Health Region. Uh, in addition, we have one more additional long-term care home uh, outbreak to report today to bring our total of outbreaks in long-term care to, to 22. Um, that includes a total of, of, of 176 of our cases and really reflects um, the, the, the difficulty that we have in, uh, in outbreaks in long-term care. I think, though, um, that we are heartened by the fact that the recent ones have been identified with a single staff person or a single resident has been uh, um, testing positive for the disease. And we know that uh, both in Vancouver Coastal and in Fraser Health, they have now very active outbreak teams for long-term care. And the measures that we've been putting in place in long-term term care and assisted living means that these are being identified very early and we are able to control them. So the vast majority of the cases unfortunately are related to, to two of the earlier outbreaks at the Lynn Valley Care Centre and at Harrow Park. Um, the slightly positive good news today is uh, our hospitalizations uh, have gone down slightly to 146 people who are currently in hospital and of those 64 are currently in uh, the critical care units or ICU. Um, on the, the more sad note, we have had an increase in deaths once again um, with four more people who have succumbed to this disease and again related, three of them were um, related to the outbreaks at Harrow Park or Lynn Valley. And our condolences, of course, and our, our thoughts go out to the family members and the care providers for those people. We now have 641 people who have completely recovered from this disease. I wanted to talk a little bit to some of the, uh, to the young people who may or may not be watching. Um, but I'm thinking, uh, I was talking with some of the, uh, of the youth in my life and I recognize that this is a very challenging time for teenagers in particular to be stuck home with your families maybe, um, to not have those social interactions that you're used to having with your friends at schools um, and the uncertainty about what's going to happen in the next few months, yeah, for particularly for those who are finishing high school, you know, the challenges about what's going to be happening, about university, about jobs in the future. And I know that can be very challenging for young people and very challenging for all of us to know how to deal with. And I just want to say, uh, you know, this is a transitional period in your life and what is happening now is extraordinary and you need to um, be comfortable in reaching out and find, find those trusted adults in your life. Don't be afraid to talk to them about what's going on, about your anxiety, about your concerns. And these are opportunities for us to work together with the young people in our life, to look up things, to find a trusted source of information, to try and, and put some normalcy, to put some, address some of the concerns that young people have. And I hope we, we can all stay connected in doing that. And we can do that in a way that supports them through this really difficult time. And you can tell by the numbers that we have, the people who are in hospital, the fact that this disease is being seen across our province, that the risk remains high for everyone here in British Columbia. We are in the middle of it. We're in the thick of things right now. And we see that with our, our colleagues in, in across the United States. We see what's happening in Ontario and Quebec and, uh, and our neighbours in Alberta. This is our time to hold the line. 
We must be unwavering in our commitment to keep our firewall up here in Brisi, to keep it strong and to flatten our curve. People have gone to extraordinary efforts and made sacrifices to protect their families, to protect our elders and seniors, to protect our health care workers and our health care system and our communities here in BC. And all of us must continue to do those basic things, to clean our hands regularly, to stay home if we can, as much as possible, to stay apart with our physical distancing, to have that safe distance between us and those, particularly our loved ones and our elders who might have severe disease if they get infected, to self-isolate if we are a traveler or if we're ill, to make sure that we're not passing this around to anybody else, and to stay connected in doing that, to stay socially connected, to find those ways of reaching out to each other and supporting each other while maintaining that safe distance. I also want to talk to travellers who are coming back, and we know that there will be more um, Canadians coming back and people coming back to BC from other parts of the world where, where this disease is causing havoc in some cases. We must support them, and you must know that when you get back, uh, you need to immediately self-isolate for 14 days. That's how we protect our families, that's how we protect our communities. And that is without question and without exception. And if you have a loved one, a family member, or somebody in your community that is coming home, we need to do what we can to support them so that we're all in this together. We can drop off groceries, we can have frequent virtual visits, we can walk their dogs for them, we can share books and video games with them. We have to have united focus for the next, for the next while. We need to, to toe this line together. We need to keep, us, keep our firewall strong in our communities across the province so that we can all be proud knowing that we have done the right thing and we are holding the line for our families and our communities. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Dr. Henry. Um, I want to share uh, uh, Dr. Henry's condolences to the families of the four people who passed away today. The 35 people who passed away from COVID-19 in British Columbia. Our, uh, our hearts go out to you on what is obviously a very, very difficult day. I want to say um, the results uh, today are are um, what we've been reporting every day, which is uh, the detailed results of what's happening in our acute care hospitals, what's happening in long-term care, what's happening in ICU, and what's happening in terms of cases uh, throughout the province. There are uh, currently 146 people in acute care hospitals uh, who have tested positive for COVID-19 as we speak. That's down two from yesterday. And uh, 63 of those are in Fraser Health, 57 in Vancouver Coastal Health. 12 in Interior Health, 10 in Island Health, and 4 in Northern Health. I would note there are 4,399 4, empty acute care beds in BC today. That's 59% uh, of the total number uh, of uh, beds are occupied. So that's 41 not occupied, to put that in context. And that's obviously uh, reflects the efforts that have been made to move people from hospital and to cancel elective surgeries, and I'll be speaking about that a little more in a second. 54.3% of our critical care beds are currently occupied uh, in BC, and the number of emergency room visits yesterday was 3,117. That compares to 6,559 um, uh, back three weeks ago on uh, March the 10th. Uh, as, as we noted, uh, there are 64 people in ICU, and to some degree, the slight change in numbers reflects that. Let's say a few things uh, again about uh, PPE. We heard disappointing uh, news from the United States today. Although it's not surprising, it reflects the challenges we faced with the United States as a source of PPE and other uh, health equipment in recent weeks. We strongly support the efforts of the Government of Canada to protect Canada's interests and to ensure uh, supplies to PPE in Canada. And just note that we live in communities that are linked. And this is part of the challenge uh, in something of such essential supply of having uh, one country of the world who undoubtedly, and our friends in the United States, are undoubtedly dealing with an extraordinary situation right now, but having um, significant control 
uh, itself over the supply chain. That said, I would note that uh, raw materials that are involved here also come from Canada. We live in a community that's strongly linked together and we hope that Canada and the United States can find a solution to this. But this reinforces our efforts to, to, uh, of the Government of Canada, the Government of British Columbia and of the community to get adequate uh, PPE, to get adequate numbers of masks here in BC. The Government of Canada has had some successes recently and we are heartened by that and we believe we are working hard and we'll have success ourselves. That redoubles those efforts. And secondly, it underlines why we need to ensure the appropriate use of PPE in our healthcare facilities. I was asked yesterday about surgeries, so I just wanted to give some updated numbers on surgeries that have been cancelled. Uh, and this is between March 17th and April 2nd. I think this number in the coming period may well be higher. The number of surgeries cancelled uh, in BC in this period, elective surgeries they're called, or scheduled surgeries, all of them medically necessary surgeries. We, I want to underline that, that 11,276 surgeries have been cancelled. And I want, want to say this, those are the numbers. Uh, and uh, just to give you a, a small breakdown, 1,208 of those are hip and knee replacements. 240 are dental surgeries, which are essential surgeries if they're required in an acute care setting. And 7,801 are other surgeries. I just want to say to people who are in need of surgeries, you are still on the list that we're committed to getting back to these procedures. I know everyone involved in surgical care in BC, the uh, anesthesiologists, the surgeons, the nurses, everyone involved is committed to doing that and ensuring that we have access uh, in, the, in the future. We are going to commit to supporting you just as we need to support right now the fight against COVID-19. I want to note because this may be of interest to people that um, earlier this month the Fraser Health Authority has uh, an agreement with the Falls Creek Surgical Centre consistent with the Canada Health Act and as you know we do about 16,000 surgeries in what are sometimes called private clinics that are public health insurance sur surgeries, in other words 100% paid for uh, by the public health care system in uh, private surgical uh, uh, um, facilities. And uh, this will give us even more flexibility as we respond to increasing wait lists after we, after we hope are able to resume normal practice in terms of elective surgeries. I want to say with respect to the numbers today that we're continuing to work very hard and there's some good news and some very challenging news in those numbers and on a day when people have passed away it's very hard to think of good news, but the, the, the slight reduction in the number of people in hospital is that way. But it has to tell us that we have to double down on our activities. And we cannot allow new circumstances to get in the way of what Dr. Henry and the whole team of people in every corner of BC and the, and the five million participants on that team, the people who live in BC, uh, are doing right now and that's why we're continuing to work with the federal government to press them to ensure that when people come to British Columbia, come to Canada from outside of the country, that the Quarantine Act measures are, are put in place effectively. Those efforts are continuing. We are working hard on that question. It would not be acceptable for us to, uh, to deal with what's already a fundamentally difficult situation that everyone in British Columbia is involved in and have our success undermined because we didn't take the proper action at this crucial time in the process. And finally, I want to thank in particular uh, today, as we do, uh, try and do every day, uh, first of all, the people at 811 because the average response time yesterday was under a minute at 811 and that reflects their extraordinary work. I want to thank all healthcare workers. I want to note, uh, I want to note that there has been some concerns expressed uh, as a consequence of the measures we've taken on parking, the free parking, and some facilities that has caused some difficulties. I just want to say that we're working on those problems and just to say to people who are not eligible to park in those facilities that they shouldn't do so. As you know, one of the challenges and uh, having worked on the hospital parking issue a little bit over the last uh, year or two, I can tell you one of the challenges with free parking has always been ensuring that everyone has access to parking. And uh, that is a difficulty at this time, even with fewer people uh, coming to the hospital. And so we're working on those issues. We hear the concerns, particularly at hospitals such as Royal Columbian, where there was a long wait list to get a parking space and that has caused some difficulties that we are working hard and we'll be enforcing, uh, even though parking may be free, it's our intention to ensure that everybody who parks, everybody who parks 
is um, is uh, does so with uh, legitimate reason, meaning that they're a patient, meaning their staff, meaning uh, uh, potentially and in the limited circumstances available now they're visiting. Finally, I want to thank um, the staff of the Ministry of Health who every day are working their guts out. Uh, the people who work here in the Ministry of Health in Victoria on Blanchard Street and across British Columbia have been doing uh, unbelievable amounts of overtime every day working hard, sometimes from home, sometimes uh, in, in office, but are uh, doing extra exemplary and extraordinary work. I'm very proud of them. I think they're, uh, they're an exceptional group of people. They provide enormous support to Dr. Henry and to our Deputy Minister Steve Brown, and I'm very, very proud of the work that they do. Dr. Henry has said that this is our flattening of our curve, but we can't take the foot off the pedal yet. It's our flattening. It's our curve. This is our fight in British Columbia, our BC effort, and this is our time and our moment. We have to do more now. We have to continue to push now. These weeks are critically important to all of us. We need ev all of you, everyone who can hear us, to be messengers for this to learn from the BCCDC if more needs to be learned on their website, what to say to our friends and our family, and ensure that you are messengers for the, the, for the measures that have been taken, the orders of Dr. Henry and the advice of Dr. Henry has put forward and so many others have put forward in BC. We can be all messengers of this. We all have to be 100% all in. We all have to ensure that these orders are supported and followed 100%. If we do that, we can continue our efforts to restrain the growth of COVID-19 in BC. Thank you, and we're happy to take your questions. Oh, en français, c'est bien. C'est vrai. Uh, nous, a, nous annonçons aujourd'hui 53 nouveaux cas pour un total de 1000, uh, 1174 cas en Colombie-Britannique. Chaque régie de santé de la Colombie-Britannique compte des patients atteints de COVID-19. 541 se trouvent à Vancouver Coastal, 412 à Fraser, 74 sur l'île de Vancouver, 126 dans l'intérieur et 21 au nord. Il y a eu 35 décès liés au COVID-19 en Colombie-Britannique, y compris 4 euh, ce jour, ce, 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 le jour dernier. Et nous sommes tristes d'annoncer ces 4 cas euh, dans le régime de santé de Vancouver Coastal. Nous offrons nos condoléances à tous ceux qui ont perdu leurs proches. Il y a maintenant 22, 22 établissements de soins de longue durée et d'aide à la vie autonome dans le régime de santé de Vancouver Coastal et Fraser, avec un total combiné de, euh, de 174 cas de COVID-19. Ce sont nos citoyens les plus vulnérables et les efforts pour les protéger continuent à être un des objectifs principaux de nos équipes de santé. À ce jour, 673 personnes dans le test de dépistage de COVID-19 a été positive, se sont rétablies et n'ont plus d'exigence d'isolement. Sur le total des cas de COVID-19, 146 personnes sont actuellement hospitalisées, dont 64 en soins intensifs. Et les autres personnes atteintes de COVID-19 rétablissent à la maison en étant isolées. Thank you very much, and we're happy to take your questions. All right. As a reminder to everybody on the phone, please press star one to queue up. You are limited to one question, and we ask that you unmute your phones. You will not be audible until we call on you. Our first question this afternoon is from Richard Zussman with Global News. Thank you very much for taking my question. For Dr. Henry, what's the message to private landlords who are upset uh, that COVID-19 testing sites are being set up in clinics in their buildings? Well, I actually hadn't heard that there was concerns about that. Uh, I know there was some concerns early on when people didn't understand what we were doing, but I can reassure people that uh, if they are um, clinics that are being established by our health authorities, that all of the safety precautions that are needed are being taken and that people shouldn't worry. And I think as well, um, we need to think about uh, people who, who need to access their physician services. And we know that a lot of people um, are, are concerned about going to their physician's office or going to the emergency room if they need it, but I want to, to emphasize how important it is for people who have chronic conditions to make sure they have an ongoing continuity of care with their clinicians. And many physicians now are doing that virtually or by phone, so I would encourage people to contact their physician's office and make sure that you are getting the advice from your clinician that you need to make sure that your conditions are, are managed through this challenging time. 
Next question is from Georgie Smith, CBC. Minister Dix, you alluded earlier that um, you alluded, alluded to this earlier. Sorry, in Nanaimo, the pulp and paper mill is providing pulp to make essential gowns and masks for American companies. Everyday workers are putting themselves at risk to make critical supplies, but not for Canadians. Given that the U.S. is now limiting N95 mask exports to Canada, what can the BC government do to ensure our resources are being used for British Columbians? Well, first of all, um, what we need to do, it seems to me, is support the Prime Minister to support our political leaders in seeing that actions that don't make sense for Americans and don't make sense for Canadians are not pursued. And so I think we should make those efforts rather than contributing and making the problems, problem worse and going tit for tat. We should work together for a result that will benefit all of us. Part of the reason we have challenges in British Columbia is because there were challenges in Washington State that COVID-19 doesn't know borders. And we want our American friends to do well. We want their response to COVID-19 to be effective. And it needs to be effective. It's important for us that it be effective. So we need to work together. And so I guess my message today is uh, that, that uh, we shouldn't respond with retaliation. We should respond with force. But we shouldn't respond with retaliation. We should respond by insisting that we work together because we are genuinely, as a whole world, in this together. And I think the kind of uh, a, a kind of parochial action such as this, and the, the amazing work done by the workers at Harmac, for example, is an example of this, is uh, is not consistent with what we need to do as a society. I'm very proud of the workers at Harmac, of the healthcare workers of Canada. And I'm also very proud and admiring of the healthcare workers of the United States, whose fate is depicted sometimes on, on your network and on other networks every day. This is our fight together. We've got what we need to do in British Columbia, but what we need to do is convince uh, our American friends in the first instance that what they've done is what this action is wrong. It's wrong for them and wrong for us. And uh, let's try and move forward together so that we're dealing with this problem. And that's, that's what we're going to do. In the meantime, though, our determination to get, uh, to get adequate masks and adequate PPE for our health care workers redoubles and redoubles and redoubles. It's not possible maybe for it to do so even more. People are working 24-7 on this. I'm proud that the Government of Canada has made some progress on that this week, which is very helpful to us. We've been working closely with health ministers across the country on this, and I can tell you that we are not going to stop until we get the, 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 the tools and the protections that our health workers need. So the response, I don't think, to these actions is um, to imitate them. The response to these actions is to respond based on the science, based on effectiveness, and based on who we are as Canadians. Cindy Harnett, Times Colonist, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, does BC support its universities getting involved in COVID-19 testing? And if so, is it, is it working alongside with Health Canada to get those uh, approvals? Uh, in terms of research, I know there has been some uh, uh, some reports, and uh, yes, we are supporting uh, some of the research that's going on in BC universities around development of tests. Uh, but they will all be uh, validated through um, the the process with Health Canada, and it's being led through our uh, BC CDC public health lab and the research team at the BC CDC that is connecting with researchers from around the province and and actually around the world around a number of these projects. Next we have Lisa Cordasco from CHLY. Thank you, yes. Um, could you please tell me what you've been hearing from your health authorities about the type and the number of non-compliance complaints you're getting and whether, I know there are calls on social media uh, for, you know, imposing fines right now and getting, but bylaw officers can't do that. How far are you prepared to go at this point to um, enforce? 
Well, there's a couple of different areas of enforcement. So we get a lot of complaints uh, that come in about people um, talking about their neighbours. And they may or may not know the story about what is happening with somebody in their community. Um, so that one is is one that we uh, address through discussion. Um, and many times uh, some of the complaints are unwarranted. In terms of things like uh, restaurant closures, the other orders that we have, um, those are much simpler and yes uh, we have a compliance and enforcement regime of protocols that we've developed in along with uh, a, an increased number of compliance officers from around the province and we announced that earlier this week so they are able to uh, our approach is first to to make sure that people are aware of uh, what the restrictions are and what the um, uh, uh, what the <laughs> What am I trying to say? What the orders are and what they need to do to comply with them. Um, but um, environmental health officers, medical health officers are able to issue fines if needed. And they have issued orders in uh, specific instances uh, against people who are doing things or businesses who are doing things that are, are a health hazard or are contravening the orders. So we have not yet had to issue a fine for anybody for um, disobeying the orders. I will also say that there are the federal quarantine orders now apply to anybody who's come into the country uh, recently and come into BC since uh, last week. And those quarantine orders are enforceable by peace officers by the RCMP and the protocol is being worked out. But there are also uh, fines that are able to be levied uh, for people who are breaching um, the federal quarantine orders. Okay, next we have a question from Jennifer Saltman with the Vancouver Sun. Oh, hi, Minister Dix, you have talked about how there must be no ambiguity when it comes to British Columbians knowing what they have to do when they return from overseas. And you said you're working with the federal government to make sure that measures are being effectively imposed. Can you be specific about what measures or enforcement you'd like to see in place that aren't now? Well, clearly uh, there needs to be a much stronger um, uh, presence and response at airports. We should see no diminution, it seems to me, in the response that we've seen um, in previous returns of people, for example, uh, from cruise ships. We have to have a vastly greater capacity to, uh, to use the Quarantine Act, which has been used in British Columbia, but uh, we need a much stronger capacity to do that. We need to actively follow up with cases. We need access to the full information. When people come to Canada, the BC Health System needs that access to full information from the Government of Canada. And we need stronger action. It seems to me that um, we're, uh, the work that everybody is doing in British Columbia, the sacrifice that every citizen is making in this province, the leadership of the health system, the leadership of Dr. Henry, uh, has to be supported by action when people come from other countries the, to ensure that quarantine orders, that, that uh, self-isolation for 14 days, which is a requirement of everyone, happens. And that will require, in addition to all the things I've described in many cases, the support of the community, because we need individuals uh, uh, where, where necessary to support by dropping off food. So that when people come to airports, they don't go past and go to Save-On, they don't go to Safeway, they don't go to Costco, they go home and they stay home. And that's going to require a lot of action and support of those individuals uh, to, to go through that period in, in self-isolation. But it will also uh, require a much stronger, robust presence at, uh, at borders and at airports. Next question comes from Imad Agahi, CTV. Hi. Yeah, just again wanted to kind of get an update and talk about uh, physical distancing, um, especially in the city of, of Vancouver, you know, the po most populated city. Uh, just seeing in Toronto, the mayor there had uh, put in a bylaw that's pretty black and white, finding people who are standing within two meters if they live together. And then we also see in Vancouver where the park board has mentioned that it has warned 1,400 people in the last two weeks for not following physical distancing rules. And, you know, it's sort of clear that maybe 1,400 people aren't um, breaking these laws on purpose. Maybe there's some confusion there. And the mayor today in Vancouver said he is going to wait for direction from um, your office in, uh, or, the, you know, from Dr. Ennick 
if they need to go black and white or they need to do more. So I'm just wondering what you think uh, about the rule that is put in place in Toronto, which is so black and white, and what we have so far in BC and in Vancouver, where it's not that certain. Yeah, you know, I actually, um, I'm not sure how, uh, there's any evidence that that type of a, of, of a bylaw is effective. It's very challenging for us to police something like that. I mean, you have to go up to somebody and ask them if they're... So I, I actually think that what we're doing is a reasonable approach. Uh, we know that this virus is mostly transmitted to those we are close with in an enclosed setting, so inside. So I am much more concerned about those parties, those homes host parties, the, the having people over um, and mixing and then them going off with others and mixing. So that's when we get these little chains of transmission is when you're spending some time with this group of people but some of them are with another group of people and those are the things that transmit this virus. So that's what we have to focus on. We have to focus on what's the, the purpose of this and the purpose is to put some distance, to build a firewall so that we can, um, we have that safe space between us and we're we're not transmitting this virus. When we're outside in a park, the, the risk of transmission is actually much less than when we're inside. So I don't want to spend a lot of time policing people outside. What we want to do is make sure that everybody knows why we're doing this and understands the risk. And I believe, for the most part, people do. We still see groups of young people, but when I'm out now, I see them, when I go for my early runs, people are, are spending time apart from each other. They're being respectful. They're walking in a distance, but they're still connected. We're saying hello. People are, are recognizing each other. And that's what we need to do to keep, us, um, to keep us going through this really challenging time. So I am appealing to everybody to do the right thing. And when we're outside, visibly outside, um, we need to stay apart from each other. But we also need to make sure that we're not having people over at home and making those, those chains of connection that can lead to us bringing it to our loved ones who may be older, um, the elders in our community, those of us who have underlying illness and may be susceptible to having severe illness with this. Next question comes from Ashley Wadwani from the Black Press. Go ahead. Hi, yeah, this would be a question I think for Minister Dix. Um, pharmacists are now allowed to restrict uh, dispensing prescriptions to a 30-day supply. Uh, we're hearing concerns from seniors and other low-income people who regularly maybe pay a one, one dispensing fee for a 90-day prescription. Um, now having to pay obviously three times. Um, so this will mean in increased costs for more dispensing fees. Uh, is this something on the BC government's radar and are they planning to address it? Uh, the, the short answer is yes. We are um, the ration. The reason we are um, asking people to stick with the 30 days right now is because we know there are supply chain issues around the world, and we want to make sure that everybody gets the medication they need. So even though you might usually get three months worth at a time for for this period of time, we're making sure that we have enough for, um, for everybody. Um, and yes, we recognize that there were dispensing fees that would um, kick in if people had to go back um, three times instead of the 90-day the prescription, and we are addressing that. We're addressing that for seniors, for people who are on Fair Pharmacare, so that it will be taken care of for most people. Marcella Bernardo, News 1130. Hi, this is actually a question for the Health Minister, Adrian Dix. Uh, you mentioned earlier about the parking situation at places like Royal Columbian Hospital and other places where now it's free. Uh, here's your chance to be an Italian mayor and start telling people to start behaving themselves. Uh, what are you doing now to, to step up enforcement so that people who don't need that parking are not accessing it? Well, what we wanted, two, two sets of things. One is that there is a genuine challenge around parking. I think people have always asked these questions. Uh, why don't you move more quickly on parking issues? We froze parking rates when I became Minister of Health and then um, we're taking, we're reviewing those questions and I think, uh, I think it's fair to say I've learned more about parking than, than many other things in my life. But I, I would say this about it. One of the challenges we face is that there are many more health workers who apply for parking than have parking spaces at some health facilities, and that's a challenge. Royal Columbian has a specific challenge. 
which is that it's at a SkyTrain station uh, at, uh, at Braid, so it's near a SkyTrain station, so it has some potential, although there's not evidence right now that it's being used widely as some sort of park and ride site. But we are going to be stepping up enforcement, and there is going to be enforcement taking for people who misuse um, parking, because we need that parking to be available for the staff uh, at, the, uh, at the hospital and for patients at the hospital. It's a very important thing. Uh, many hospitals are running below capacity right now, but that the, the obviously the reason why we've ensured that there's space available is to prepare for a much more serious situation later. And we can't have a situation uh, a week from now, two weeks from now, where the stories that you've heard, Marcella, are, uh, are uh, continue to happen. So there will be more enforcement. People need to know that this is not an occasion this the decision to go to free parking was to support our health care workers and to support people who need to use hospital services right now and people i hope will respect that and i think overwhelmingly they are there are some challenges it's two two hospitals in particular i think royal columbia and st paul's and we're working through that with enforcement so uh it's a challenge to deal with these things. I think it's absolutely the right decision to make parking free on behalf in support of healthcare workers. There's some technical challenges and we've got to deal with that on the one hand with enforcement and I agree with you. It's unacceptable if people are misusing parking that's been made available for free on the one hand and the other is some organization to ensure that people uh, get access to parking spaces and people aren't taking spaces that are required for example for, uh, for nurses or doctors with specific uh, emergency requirements. Brenna Owens, Canadian Press. Thank you. Um, yeah, Dr. Henry, yesterday, I think it was, you spoke about um, kind of some of the enhanced surveillance that's happening in prisons and other places where there's kind of people in close quarters. And I was wondering about oversight for uh, and, and increased surveillance and what that entails in places like the downtown east side and also places where there are migrant workers. Yeah, so uh, a couple of things. Um, uh, there's a, a program that's run through uh, public health um, in both those areas. Um, so migrant workers in the interior, for example, when we're looking at uh, the camps that uh, uh, where we had the outbreak. But also there's a, a systematic program in the downtown east side and a few other places. One is to screen for symptoms. So if people have a change in their health status, if they um, have a, a new cough or a change in their cough, it's obviously a challenging situation with many people with underlying illnesses in that situation, um, that we have a rapid response team that's able to do testing um, if need be and to be able to monitor people in a more systematic way than we have in the past. So if they come into, when they come into a shelter, for example, being screened, asking them about how they're feeling, taking temperatures if need be. So those are the, the types of things that we do, very similar to what we're doing in long-term care homes where um, staff are being monitored every day where um, each resident is being monitored every day to see if they've developed a new symptoms that might be indicative of this. And part of it is of course having the available testing strategy so that we can um, detect it if it happens and a plan for what to do. So as, as soon as somebody is detected they're able to be either removed from the area or isolated within an area where they um, are protected until the test results come back for example. Next question is from my, oh. Oh, okay. I, oh. I've had a request to uh, restate the numbers. I guess there was an audio yeah. issue early on. Okay. Um, so the, the case update for today, we have 53 test positive new cases in British Columbia, which brings our total up to 1,174. And that includes 541 people in Vancouver Coastal Health, 412 in Fraser Health, 74 um, cases on Vancouver Island Health, uh, 126 in the Interior Health Region and 21 in Northern Health Region. Uh, we have one additional long-term care home outbreak, bringing that total to 22. Um, of these people, uh, 146 people are hospitalized today in British Columbia and of those, 64 are in intensive care unit. Um, or in critical care areas. Uh, we've had, unfortunately, an increase of four deaths to bring our total number of people who have died from COVID-19 in BC to 35. In addition, we have 641 people who have now been cleared and are fully recovered. Good. 
Okay, next question is from Mike Hager with the Globe and Mail. Hi there, Dr. Henry, Mr. Dix. I want to ask about body count, uh, not the thrash metal band, but uh, projected death totals. Uh, Ontario came out with their projected uh, body count, and you guys have been reluctant so far to release that. Do you have uh, a range of deaths that you have predicted? No. Next question is from Jeff Andreas, Radio NL. I, I, we do not um, predict it, um, and we are modeling is not to predict. Modeling it gives you a sense of what could happen in different scenarios. And as we present it, the modeling we've done really is about how do we prepare so that we can meet those scenarios no matter what happens. And our numbers tell um, the story of what happens. You can't predict where this is going to erupt. We all have our own pandemic that we're moving through, and even in different parts of BC it's quite different. So in the Lower Mainland, uh, we know that uh, the, the outbreak has been driven by, unfortunately, um, this virus getting into long-term care homes, and particularly, too, that it um, got into very early before it was recognized, and, uh, and 24 of our 35 people who have died have been from those long-term care homes. So, you know, you can't model that, you can't predict that. And so that's why I don't feel it's, it's particularly useful to, ha to use that as part of our modeling. What we need to know is what resources do we have so that we give everybody the best chance they have of surviving this disease and also ensuring that we have the health services and health care that's available for everybody else who needs it at the same time. So that's the approach that we've taken here in BC. Jeff Andreas, Radio NL. Um, as part of the state of provincial emergency, I know a lot of communities were asked to start making other facilities available for a number of reasons, you know, including if there was extra capacity needed for our other hospitals, uh, our, our hospital system. Uh, you know, we see field hospitals and 10 hospitals opening in other countries. And, and Minister Dix, you know, you tell us about bed capacity daily and, and the numbers you provide make it sound like there's quite a bit of room left to grow. but. Uh, you know, if the trends we've seen in BC over the last week continue, can our hospital system handle this load? You know, for how long can it handle it? And at what point could we start seeing people, uh, you know, being needed to use other types of facilities outside of hospitals? Yeah, so you know, this is why um, we have made um, such a, uh, why this, these two weeks are so important. This is our second incubation period since we, we put in the, the strong social distancing measures, the, the closing of, of in-classroom um, schooling, um, the travel restrictions that we've had, so, and you know, the strong response around outbreaks in, in, in healthcare settings. And the first incubation period, there were people who were already exposed. And we knew that there were people who were going to be getting sick and that we, there was nothing we could do at that point but try and detect them and make sure the healthcare system was able to care for them. And we are in that phase now. We're seeing, uh, you know, 50 people a day who, who are, um, be, are positive for this disease and a number of them who need health care. This next two weeks is there our time, this is our line, um, where we're going to understand if those measures we put in place are working. And as I mentioned last week, I, I see a glimmer of hope. You know, we are not seeing dramatic increases in the number of people who are, are positive, the number of people who are needing hospital care and ICU care every day. We're seeing increases, but it's staying steady. And if this continues, we have the capacity, and we've shown you that, we have the capacity to care for people appropriately, to make sure that we're not going to be overwhelmed and that we're able to care for everybody else who needs health care as well. But we, there are many, many things we are not in control of, and we can't, and we can't yet say what is going to happen. So we're um, doing the surveillance that I mentioned in communities very actively. We're picking up cases and outbreaks. We've seen that in uh, the correctional facility. We've seen that in the community outbreaks that we've seen. Um, and we're actively, the public health teams all around the province are actively following up on people and their cases and their contacts in different settings around the province so that we don't get a dramatic increase. 
but we need to continue to do that over the next couple of weeks and we need to watch what's happening around us because we are, of course, um, we're part of that global community and what is happening in the United States affects what's happening here. We also know that there are people coming back that are being repatriated to BC from countries that are dealing with COVID-19. So we need to have a strong system in place to be able to detect if any of them become ill and make sure those transmission chains are, are stopped. So that's a very complicated way of saying, it, you know, we're, we're coping right now, but there are many, many knowns and unknowns, unknown unknowns and known <laughs> unknown unknowns that could affect us in the next couple of weeks. And that's why it's so important that we hold the line, that all of us continue to do what we're doing because it's working, it's helping, it's making a difference for our healthcare system and for our communities right now. So before we take our last question, I just want to remind uh, all reporters on the phone that if you didn't get a chance to ask a question today, there will be a state room statement released later this afternoon with all the information covered off. From recommendations on protecting families and communities from COVID-19, visit bccdc.ca. For non-medical questions about the province's COVID-19 response, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash COVID-19. And for a full listing of the provincial health officer's orders, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash PHO guidance. And our last question today comes from Albert Sue from Fairchild TV. Go ahead. Albert? Okay. I think that's it. Thank you. Oh, you're going to, okay. Just one more, one more thing to add yep. to the question with respect to um, measures we need to take about travelers here. One, we, we simply have to have, uh, and, and we're working on this, I know the federal government is, uh, more quarantine space to potentially quarantine people who are coming through. And the second and the final thing I'd mentioned in those, those measures we need is much stronger, I think, uh, screening at, at departure for people coming uh, to British Columbia, whether they're coming from uh, Seattle or whether they're coming from overseas. Uh, we obviously need more stronger screening at that point because we need to ensure that uh, people who are sick uh, get well uh, where they are before they travel. Thank you. Thank you Thank for you. today.